because of the instructions that he gets from Jesus. Yeah. Tear up your agenda. Tear up your schedule. When you wake up, say, here I am. I'm ready to grow in you. I'm ready for you to take over. I'm turning myself over to you. I'm ready to go. And the Holy Spirit says, those are my marching orders. To take people by the hand that are ready to what? Be led by the Spirit. That's what we just read here. Led by the Spirit. Someone is leading someone else. And that is our choice. Who would like to read Galatians 5, 19 to 21? Pretty bad stuff. Mary Jane? Now Galatians work, 5, 19 to 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the likes, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Thank you. Paul is making this list for people in Galatia, the converts to Christianity, from the Gentile world and converted Jews to Christianity. Some people say, well, that was a bad vaccine back there. Back there? <laughs> what about today? Who would like to read 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5? 2 Timothy chapter 3, 1 to 5. Volunteer. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 1 to 5. I will. Okay. But know this that in the last days, prelious times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, bolsters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, <coughs> without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, Haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people, turn away. That's it, one through five. Thank you. Not a good list. It's Second Timothy 3, 1 through 5. Not a good list. My Lord. Does that describe the time that we're living in today? Yes. yes. Pretty accurate? I see it every day. Sure. Sure. So, what happens to believers when they turn from the truth of the gospel? The power of God of salvation. They slip under control of Satan. Very good. We choose to go under the control of Satan, which is what? Our sinful nature. Do we understand that? It, it's one or the other. There is no in-between and there is no third choice. In verse 21, did you notice the expression, and the like? In verse 21, and the like. Which means that all the things listed in verses 19 and 20 preceding verse 21 are what? They are identical in essence. In essence means it doesn't matter which category we're choosing to experience. In the sight of God, it's what? Ungodly. 
transgression, it is ungodly. Is hatred murder? Yes. First John three fifteen. Is anger murder? Yes. Jesus says so in Matthew five twenty one and twenty two. Is pride, envy, jealousy murder? Jesus says yes in First John and John eight forty four. In Isaiah fourteen twelve to fourteen. But anger. Uh, how do we? T okay. What do you do? We do get angry. So, you turn from anger to God, I do get rid of that. I mean, sometimes I just really can't help myself. The other day I was just angry. I got over it, but I murder, I don't want to be a murderer. <laughs> Did everyone hear the question? Right. There is an honest human being. Do Amen. we have to deal with this from time to time? Yes. Did she just describe that she went through it this past week? Oh, so you ask for forgiveness. You ask when you get, when you do better, you know, like, it's that I'm asking, Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me for being angry and saying the things that I've said. Mm -hmm. Is that what I should do? Yes. Yeah. We should be genuinely remorseful and repentant. Did Jesus come to this world to forgive me of my losing my cool, my anger? Did he did he come for that? Yes. But what was the main reason for coming? To save us. Conquer the condition that produces what? Sin. He came to defeat sin. That's why Jesus came, to defeat the condition in me that produces anger. And that's why he says, inspires Paul to say what? In Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Yeah. Nevertheless, I still have a pulse. Right. Yet not I, but Christ living in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, which has the potential to get angry, I live by the faith of Jesus Christ, who gave himself for me. That is what Jesus came for. Yes, did he come to forgive the human race of all of their past sins, present sins, and future sins? Yes or no? But what kind of a life can we expect on this earth if we just... Oh, I messed up again, Jesus. I'm really sorry. I'm really remorseful. Please don't burn me in hell. When you come back, take me to heaven. I'm really sorry. Is that it? Is that what Jesus came to this world? No. Yes, He does forgive us when we are truly remorseful. But He came to conquer the condition that produces that. And so, visually, symbolically, what does he inspire the Apostle Paul to say in Galatians 2.20? I just quoted it to you. I am crucified with Christ, which means what? Self is what? Dead. dead. So if self is dead, can self get angry? No. no, it's dead. Once you're buried six feet under physically, can you get angry at anyone? No. no. And that's the visual, symbolic aspect of, I am crucified with Christ. Did Jesus crucify the flesh? Yeah. In Matthew 26, 29 through 31, I think it is, he says three times, Lord, if there's any way of getting me out of this, do it now. Did God say, okay. If God had said okay and Jesus said thank you, you and I would be lost. So the question is, did Jesus come to forgive me of my sins? Yes. But what else did he do? He came to conquer the condition that produces hatred, pride, envy, jealousy. And once 
I understand what it means to be crucified in him and with him, he guarantees, what? He guarantees that I will eventually live the life that he lived. He guarantees it. Which means what? When by the grace of God, I am living a sinless life, well, I know it. No, because I'm not focused on living a sinless life. I'm focused on what? Being crucified with Christ in every decision, experience, and temptation. Do we understand that? When by the grace of God I'm living a sinless life, am I ever going to feel it? How can you possibly feel it when you are indwelt with a sinful nature? That is a contradiction. How can anyone feel that they're living a sinless life? That's absurd. Right. You had a question. Yeah. I read somewhere, and I don't know where it is, but it said, um, the angry do not sin. Where is that? And what does that I don't know. Find it for me. It's in Ephesians 4.26. That's the question I was going to say. Ephesians 4.26. Okay. Let's turn there. Ephesians 4.26. Crucifying self. That's the only way that Stephen 
could have said to the people that were stoning him to death, Lord forgive them, they, you know, they don't know what they're doing. They're murdering him, they're stoning him to death. Would that be like somebody cutting you off in your, in your car and they cut you off and almost maybe cause you to have a wreck? And you, in your mind you go, oh darn, <laughs> you know. But do you stop it there or do you follow that person down the road and force him off the road and pull the gun? Then you're giving into it, you know. Very good. So at what point is it not a sin? Pardon? Based on what he said and what her responded, at what point is the anger not a sin? It caused me to think. We were at asking, what point? Is, is anger a murder? Murder. <laughs> and so, okay, so sin I'm is saying, a murder? Okay. Yes, I'm at, so I'm at what saying, point? At what point? Because if you want to use it as Jesus, I read it up to this week, righteous indignation. Christ's anger is nothing compared to us. So, at what point, like somebody cut you off, as simple as cutting you off, you're so angry even though you're not chasing them. So, and somebody says stuff about you that get you so aggravated, you're so angry, but you're trying not to entertain it. So, I'm trying to figure out at what point, is it after you start praying for it, or is it immediately you let it go? Uh, I can only answer personally. The moment that I take it personally, that's anger. Thank you very much. <laughs> the, Thank because you. what has happened? You Self can, has been resurrected course. from the grave. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. When Jesus was yep. tried, and you can call that a legal trial, did he ever defend himself? Nope. No. What I happened? He got slaughter. slapped in the face for not responding. But when his, his father's mouth. law was questioned, was he right in their face with an answer? That's the difference. Lois? Christ is our example. And when he was put on the cross, he said, forgive them. For they know not what they do. And I feel I have anger that really wells up and say, Lord, help me. Help me. Control my mind. Control my whole being. Because I know it's wrong. And I know Christ's example is not there. It's the opposition. And I'm being controlled by that opposition. And I need to put it in God's, I need to have that mindset that puts it in Christ's hands and not in the opposition's hands. Excellent. In the first chapter of the Patriarchs and Prophets, it's titled, Why Was Sin Permitted? In that chapter, the author explains the process by which Satan eventually chose to rebel. It was a process. And she uses a very interesting word that I can identify with. And the word is dismiss. She says, Satan refused to dismiss those thoughts of envy and pride that he had against Jesus. Because Satan wanted to be equal in the council of heaven with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so he entertained those thoughts. And she said, he refused to dismiss the thoughts. That's all you and I can do. If we are focused on what Paul is writing about here in Romans 5, which is the how-to. Not should, ought, and must. That's old covenant. God doesn't tell us to, we should do this, we ought to do this, or we must do that. He also he only says what? Will you crucify self and allow me to take over your life? So when I have those thoughts, and I am cut off when I drive from time to time, once a week I drive to Orlando on Highway 4, <laughs> Now, I come from California, and uh, we have some fast drivers there. My wife, when we get off of the plane in California, and we get our rental car, she says, you're a different person. You don't drive here, you don't drive the same way here that you do in Florida. <laughs> well, because I know the way they drive over there. And if you don't drive a certain way in California, you will not survive. <laughs> so, the question is, how Am I going to react when I'm cut off? Dismiss. Dismiss what I would like to do to that person. And I won't even give you a list of the things that my sinful nature would like to do to that person. But I'm learning to dismiss it. That is the solution. Dismiss based on what? They don't know what they're doing. They're driving irresponsibly. Whatever it may be. Whatever it may be, 
The focus should be on solution. Scriptural solution. If we believe that this is inspired. If we believe that Jesus identified with us at the incarnation and he went through things that you and I will ever, ever go through. In fact, it was more difficult because he could have just thought something and that would have annihilated the person. Mm -hmm. Just thought it. Of course, that would have also annihilated us for eternity. And that's what's at stake here. That's what's what was at, that is what was at stake when Jesus came. Had he ever turned over to self, you and I would be lost. Now the question is, do I want to have Jesus have the same influence in my life so that we can bring an end to life on this earth, which I call this vomit called life on planet earth? Do we want to bring an end to that? The only way that the scripture says we can bring an end to that is by identifying with where Christ is at, which apartment is he in? What's he doing there? He's interceding for you and for me the way that his father interceded for him when he was here. He turned every decision, experience, and temptation over to his heavenly father. And he allowed who to lead him? The Holy Spirit. I call it the Holy Spirit, the designated driver. Because even though Jesus has saved me, does that qualify me to live life on planet Earth on my own? No. no. And that's we have the designated driver, the Holy Spirit, to lead us. That's the word that we read a while ago. Leading us. Okay. I have about what? Six minutes? Mary Jane? Five? Yeah. Did you have a question with you? Please. Yes, when when um, we were reading like the angel and not like the same and you know the sun go down and the I I don't know if it was my mom telling me growing up, but you're supposed to ask you ask God forgiveness, but I think you're supposed to also ask that person that made you so angry uh, to forgive you because we always ask God to forgive us. And then, you know, growing up you always hear um, you know, don't go that angry. So maybe that's the day saying before that day ends and night comes to make sure you rectified it or told the person, you know, I'm sorry that they don't know that you got so angry, but to let them know that please forgive me. I don't understand it that way, but that's a good idea. If I have offended someone by anything that I have said or done, I need to go to the make a cross to if I have, is temptation a sin? Yes. No. 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 I mean, Jesus would be the biggest sinner ever. He was tempted more than anyone else. So, if I am going through an experience, and I'm having a thought, and I choose to dismiss it, I don't need to make things right with anyone. I need to say, thank you, Lord, for giving me the victory over those thoughts that came into my mind but that I did not what? Entertain, or execute, or put into action. That is how I understand that. Do not go to bed, or go to sleep, or whatever, until you have made something right with someone that you have had a misunderstanding with. That's how I understand. Okay. Uh, how about some good news and solutions? Yeah. <laughs> Let's read Galatians 5, 22 and 23. By the way, why does the flesh need to be crucified? Because it's the biggest problem we have in our lives. <laughs> right. Because this yeah. week I was reading, last couple weeks ago, I think it was a hurricane week, and I was reading Righteousness by Faith by E.T. Jones. And it was just amazing how he described it, and I was sharing it with my daughter and a couple of friends, and said, the enemy uses the flesh, and the mind follow the flesh, and Christ uses the mind and allows the mind to lead the flesh. And you, you contemplate, you know, I don't know if anybody struggle, but you, you just wonder why this terrible sin in our lives. And you look around you and you see it and it just the world has gone crazy. And everybody is being controlled by the flesh. And the flesh is completely living the entire life. And the mind is just going along with the flesh. And I said, God, that's why Christ said, 
lest this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And I said, if I could wake up one day and have the complete mind of Christ, and my favorite book is Desire of Ages, and I was saying to my daughter this morning that I want to be like Jesus. Because of when I look at when he raised Lazarus from the dead and he stepped away, he didn't stay there for them to glorify him and praise him. And I said, Nashel, I so want to be like Jesus. I want the mind of Christ. And I desire it, but what the struggle in my life? Why can't I just get over sin? I'm not talking about committing adultery, stealing. I'm not talking about those big stuff that the law will get you. I'm talking about the small stuff that bothers you, the small stuff that the only time you see it is when you're on your knee. How? Give me the solution for that. <laughs> well, I gotta hear this. Is that, do you like, do you like the honesty that came out of Paul? Absolutely. Can we say, Amen. That applies to me too. Amen. Can, can I say something? Sure. I'll, I'll possibly be quick. You know, it, it, it makes it a lot easier to look at the problem of sin if we understand that sin is not about you. It, it is, we're not responsible for bringing sin in this world. It is of another world. So when you look at sin, even sin against you, what's, what, what, what he said, when Chuck said, don't take it personally. That means that when a sin is, when someone sins against me, if I take it personally, then I'm going to respond in flesh. If I look at it spiritually, which is what it is, then I respond the way Jesus responded. When Jesus was tempted, what did he say? It is written. So this is the response in his will that we respond to. It is written. It is written. So it is not I, but he that lives in me. So when you do that and you practice that, then you allow, allow sin to dwell in your body. And this is the victory over sin. Thank you. Who had gained a complete victory? What? I'm saying who sit here who have gained complete victory over sin. Complete. <laughs> I'm saying complete victory. No, absolute, no sin. Well, would you recognize it if you saw it? <laughs> if you have a sinful nature, how can you possibly recognize sinless living? You can't. Yes, so why should we ever talk about sinless living? It's none of our business. That's Jesus' business. Can't. But we got that? Can't. Can't even identify. And you cannot know it. No. <laughs> if you focus on dying to self, how can you possibly know that you're living a sinless life? That's a complete 180 contradiction. <laughs> so what should our focus be? Jesus. Solutions. And we're going to find solutions in Galatians 5, 23, 23. Who would like to read that? Galatians 5. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Let's wait a moment for everybody to find it. This is the solution verse. Okay, go. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, let's go back to verse 19. How does verse 19 of, of Galatians 5 begin? So the works of the flesh are manifest. What? Works of the flesh. The works of the who? The flesh are manifest. Which and how does verse 22 begin? Fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. And which one applies to you depends on who? You. Who are you going to allow to be in control of you? Do you have a choice? He's not asking you to work on the results. He's asking you to make a choice. Why? Why can the flesh inherit the kingdom of God? Because it cannot be converted. That's what we are. Our nature cannot be converted. So what's the solution? Crucify. There is no other solution. Do we understand that? Well, I need to try harder. I need to pray more. I need to get up early and read my Bible more. I need to distribute more literature. The list of shoulds, oughts, and musts must are just endless. That's all old covenant. Focus on who? Terrific me. That's what Satan wants me to focus on. Terrific me. Jesus wants me to focus on terrific who? Him. Him. Do we have a choice in the matter? Yes. 
Yes? Okay, I've run out of time again. Is it biblically possible to live the life that Jesus lived on this earth? Yes, it is. You and me. Let's read verses 24 and 25 of Galatians 5. I'll read it. Galatians 5, 24 and 25. Now those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Does that include everything that is bad in me? Yes. 